Today's episode is sponsored by SeatGeek. If you're looking for any last minute NFL tickets this season, or maybe tickets for something else like NBA games or concerts or any other live event, check out the link in the description below, download the app and use promo code Brett for $20 off your first order of tickets, no matter what the event is. I've used SeatGeek a lot this season already to buy tickets to see the Rams, Texans, Steelers, Buccaneers, and Chargers all in different games, and I cannot speak highly enough about how easy it is to use, especially on the app. So again, grab that extra $20 discount at the link in the description below, enter promo code BRETT, and you're good to go. Thank you again to SeatGeek for helping to make this show possible, and with that, let's get to it. The 49ers have an interesting dilemma to deal with tomorrow when they take on the Kansas City Chiefs in the Super Bowl. Everyone already knows what the ideal game plan is for beating Patrick Mahomes, just run the ball over and over and keep him off the field entirely, but over the last two months of the season, actually running the ball against Kansas City consistently has been easier said than done. I broke this down in part one of my Super Bowl preview yesterday when I still had a voice because I wasn't super sick, but if you haven't watched that one, the short version of that episode is that KC's platoon of unknown defensive tackles, Mike Pinnell, Derek Nadi, and Colin Saunders, have completely transformed the Chiefs' interior run defense and made them one of the tougher fronts to run on in the entire league. Over the back half of the season, KC went from allowing over 100 yards per game and over 5.5 yards per carry on interior runs alone to allowing only 55 yards per game at less than 4 yards per carry on those same runs in their final 6 games. Their turnaround was downright remarkable, but just because Kansas City made massive improvements doesn't mean that they don't still have weaknesses, and unfortunately for them, those weaknesses just so happen to conveniently align with something that San Francisco already does very well, run to the edges. In those final six games where there was overall improvement in the unit, the Chiefs' edge run defense in particular arguably got worse, going from allowing 4.8 yards per carry to 5.7 and even teams that were average at best at running to the edges like the Raiders and Chargers routinely ripped off big gains outside. It was, and still is, a huge issue for Casey's defense, primarily because running around their stout defensive tackles rather than right at them forces their DBs, linebackers, and in some cases the defensive ends to pick up the slack, but quite frankly very few of those players are good enough to do so. I think back to the Chargers game just a month ago where almost 70% of LA's rushing production against the Chiefs came on runs to the edges with the Chargers averaging just over 5.8 yards per carry on those runs and you could see them have success on plays like crack toss and toss lead over and over again even when running directly into the strength of that Chiefs 4-3 over front. That game plan worked simply because toss plays momentarily take the defensive line out of the equation at the line of scrimmage by pinning them to the backside away from the ball carrier, and runs like that one put all of the pressure instead on DBs and linebackers to get off blocks, set the edges, and make all the tackles themselves. If they don't do any of that, it's basically a guaranteed first down every single time you run that play. Trust me, it's a hell of a lot easier to run against Pinnell, Nadi, and Saunders when you make them chase you around and tackle you five yards past the line of scrimmage on cleanup duty rather than just running it straight up the gut and letting them stack and shed into the A-gap. You better believe that Kyle Shanahan and the 49ers know that going into this game as well. And in fact, in the NFC Championship game just a couple weeks back, Shanahan showed off just how diverse his edge run game could be against a Packers defense that was equally committed to stopping all of their zone runs inside. In that game, the Niners ripped off 134 yards and two touchdowns just on edge runs alone out of their total of 285 yards, which is an incredible rate of production. They have so many ways to get into a variety of crack toss and toss lead schemes that punish DBs in space, and it's impossible to break all of them down because it would just take way too long, and clearly my voice couldn't handle that. But one of my favorite play calls from that game really does a good job of simply showing you what Kansas City is up against here. This play came early in the second quarter when the score was still relatively close-ish, 
The Niners were in 22 personnel here, and they motioned into offset eye right, with the strong side of the formation being to the wide side of the field, so there was a lot of space to work with. And right here before the ball is snapped, you can see exactly what the Packers' game plan was. They wanted to run this 5-2 front out of their base personnel to plug as many gaps at the line of scrimmage as possible because that's really the best way to shut down any traditional zone running game. Just occupy every single gap front side and force a cutback into a free defender on the back side. But Kyle Shanahan was not going to oblige them in that game plan. He wasn't just going to run into a human brick wall like Kenny Clark repeatedly if he didn't have to, so he called a lot of these toss lead schemes just to go around that D-line instead. This whole design is really built around the blockers out in space on the front side of the play. You've got to have a good double team on the play side 3 technique so that the right tackle can climb up quickly to the second level and pick off the will linebacker on the back side. And remember, like I touched on yesterday, this will backer, Blake Martinez, is in a very thick alignment to the front side of the play, so that right tackle has plenty of time to double team the 3 tech and then climb up. He doesn't just have to make the guard do it all by himself because this alignment of Martinez gives him that luxury. And beyond that play side double team, it's also important that Kyle Juszczyk and George Kittle are on point with their blocks as well, which of course usually they are. Kittle is supposed to just let that outside linebacker, Zadarius Smith, shoot into the backfield and not even worry about him because his primary concern is actually BJ Goodson, who in this blocking scheme would be identified as the Mike to the play side, by the way. And it's Juszczyk's job to adjust his angle as necessary against Smith in the backfield to funnel him either inside or outside. He has to trust that Mostert will read whatever leverage is generated on that block, again, whether it's inside or outside, and he has to trust that he'll make the appropriate cut. So all together, when every part of the machine is working as one, you've got the play side edge defender getting pinned inside by use check because that's where he jumps to. The play side three technique defensive tackle is also getting reach block because of the double team. The will linebacker is getting picked up by Mike McGlinchey and you've got the Mike linebacker getting driven all the way out to Narnia by George Kittle. So every single yellow helmet is accounted for, which obviously is good, but it's less about Shanahan being able to match numbers for numbers and more about him just knowing how to avoid or redirect the Packers best run defenders using angles and timing. And don't get me wrong, Zadarius Smith and Kenny Clark are both amazing run defenders, but on crack toss, toss lead, counter pitch, all of those kinds of play designs that just get the ball out to the edges fast with blockers in space, those kinds of runs are meant to make those great defensive linemen powerless. They are then forced to rely on Blake Martinez or BJ Goodson or Jair Alexander beating a block, or failing that, eventually they'll have to rely on Darnell Savage making a shoestring tackle in space. It just takes away so much control from that defensive line, regardless of how good they are at the line of scrimmage, and that kind of stress testing for corners and linebackers in space is just not sustainable for any defense, especially when all of their worst run defenders are their corners and linebackers. Kyle Shanahan understands that concept. He gets how to create angles, how to scheme up ways to take your best players out of the game. And truth be told, I don't think there's any coach in the entire NFL that does it better than he does, particularly in the run game. And I'll tell you what, because I know Kyle is that kind of coach, I would bet my bottom dollar right now that Debo Samuel gets a carry inside the 10 yard line this Sunday if the 49ers are lined up on either the left or right hash. I believe that in my bones, and if there was a prop bet for it, I would do it in a heartbeat because A, the 49ers already set that play up on tape against the Packers in their last game, and B, because we've already seen that exact same concept work against this same Chiefs defense earlier this year. Ironically enough, the Packers were even the ones to run it against them. Just hear me out on this because I promise I'll only sound a little bit crazy. That play was in the same second quarter of the NFC Championship game. Again, it was down inside the 10 yard line from the left hash and the Niners were in trips right from 11 personnel. Though I guess maybe you can consider it quads and not trips if you count the running back, but some people don't count the running back if it's in the backfield. I guess it just depends on who you're asking. But anyway, I'm just gonna call it trips right. And off the motion from the number three receiver inside, which is Debo Samuel, they ran what I can only describe as a variation of the inverted veer, 
Some systems call it a dash read, except there's no QB option component to the play at all. It's almost like they wanted the edge defender Kyler Fackrell to jump really hard and wide outside to stop the potential sweep from Debo, which is one of the main design features of the inverted veer because it just takes Fackrell out of the run fit entirely and lets Mostert follow his pulling guard on the power run inside. But at least in college when you saw this play with TCU or Ohio State or Auburn, it was pretty much always the quarterback being the one to run on power, not the running back, so the responsibilities and reads are kind of flipped here. Fackrell jumped inside first and took on the guard instead of following the sweep, so just like in inverted veer, Mostert just put his foot in the ground and bounced outside while using Depot as his lead blocker. And again, you know, if you're asking a linebacker like Blake Martinez to make a tackle one-on-one -on -one in space against a running back that runs 4-3, that's just not going to happen. So Mostert was easily able to score. But this play fascinated me just from a pure design standpoint because it really reminds you of the inverted veer that took over college football a decade ago, starting with Andy Dalton at TCU, and then later Cam Newton at Auburn, and then Ohio State ran it, Florida ran it, the service academies ran it, the list goes on and on. But the read component of the play, at least here under Kyle Shanahan, is now for the running back and not the quarterback. To me at least, that just goes to show how creative Shanahan can get to take a run scheme that is really the furthest possible thing from traditional outside zone and incorporate that into his arsenal of run plays that fit his unique personnel. That is the main reason why I bring up Debo getting the ball tomorrow on a progression play call off of that inverted veer because Shanahan kind of obviously set that up based on the skill sets of his personnel, or at least to me he did. When we see Samuel motioning from his number three spot, all I can think of is a pseudo rushing touchdown that we saw Aaron Jones score all the way back in week eight against this same Chiefs defense. And on that play, Jones also motioned from, I guess we'll just call it a quads look now, but then on a pre-snap return motion, he took a tap pass and used Jamal Williams as a lead blocker on basically just outside zone lead strong, a very normal run scheme, except this was just from a slightly different personnel package and a slightly different formation that we're used to seeing. And with the built-in motion, Jones was already up to speed as he got the ball, so he got to the edge quicker. The lead block from Williams guaranteed they would get five on five to the play side, leaving the nearest unblocked defender to fight through a whole lot of trash just to get into position to make a tackle, which obviously he could not. I mean, it's just very hard to stop this play in less than 10 yards before the goal line. That is, unless you way overcommit to it. And then once you do start overcommitting, that's when you run into the problem of the play action game off of those fake tap pass zones or tap pass crack toss looks where you've got the entire defense flowing one way with the pre-snap motion only to have a tight end or a receiver just slip out the back door for an easy touchdown. There's just, there's almost no winning here, to be honest, unless you have an entire secondary full of guys who can beat one-on-one -on -one blocks in space and make the tackle all on their own. It's just not going to happen. And to be clear, I'm not saying that it's impossible for the Chiefs to stop this play. I'm just saying that it's highly likely that they are going to see it or some variation of it because they already suck at stopping runs to the edge. The 49ers are already elite at running to the edge and Debo Samuel as both a runner and receiver is one of the most dynamic weapons on that entire team. They are going to see something like this play, especially in the red zone, and the Chiefs have to be ready for it because at some point Kyle Shanahan won't even care if you know it's coming if he knows that you can't get off the blocks anyway. Make no mistake about it, the 49ers are going to do everything in their power to avoid Kansas City's stellar defensive tackle rotation because they know they don't have to go through them if they don't want to. There are just so many things for this KC defense to try to process on any given snap, both when reading the run game and the play action pass game, that I just don't see any way that the Chiefs are going to be able to slow down this 49er offense. Pinnell, Nadi, and Saunders are all badasses. I truly believe that, and that's why I made an episode on them yesterday. But in my opinion, everyone else in that front is not good enough. They just aren't. If the Chiefs win this game, which is still a strong possibility because their offense is absolutely ridiculous, that victory will be because of everything but their run defense.
Their pass defense has to generate a turnover or two, which is where the Honey Badger comes in. Their special teams needs to control field position. Their passing offense needs to be able to quickly get and keep a lead so that Shanahan cannot just run all day. And Andy Reid needs to be able to reserve his timeouts for as long as humanly possible because more than likely he's going to need them late in the game if they fall behind or if it's tied and they have one last drive to work with. I said yesterday that one of the most important matchups and one of the most underappreciated matchups in this game was the interior of Kansas City's defense taking on the interior of San Francisco's offense, which is still true. But if I'm also right that Kyle Shanahan is just going to try to go around them to take them out of the game, Steve Spagnuolo is in trouble. I still don't have a pick for this matchup, and truth be told, I'll probably still not have one until the last possible second. But what makes this game so hard to pick is that I don't think either team can stop each other. Both of these offenses match up extremely well with each other's defenses, and if this game doesn't end up with both teams scoring over 30 points, I would be very surprised. How these teams get to 30 will obviously be very different, but they'll both probably do it. So really, unless you are a 49ers or a Chiefs fan, the only way to pick this game is to ask yourself who you trust more. Kyle Shanahan or Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes or the Niners D-line, San Francisco's edge run game or Tyron Matthew. Both of these teams are flat out amazing, and both of them have a claim to be the very best in the NFL, so I just don't know who I trust more yet. Maybe that makes me a shitty analyst, maybe that's a cop-out, maybe I'm just really scared of putting the Coleman curse on either of them, but I really don't care. I can't pick this game. Both teams are too good, the matchups are too close, and it's probably going to come down to one or two plays that nobody sees coming that can flip it either way. The only thing that we can ask for as football fans in this kind of situation for the 100th season in the history of the NFL is to be given a great Super Bowl matchup with likable players we can root for, some redemption arcs mixed in, and a few rising superstars that herald a new generation for the league. I don't know about you guys, but at least for me, I'm just thankful that the final game of the year also happens to be the best game of the year. And on that note, I do just want to say thank you all again for sticking with the film room for yet another full season. I cannot believe that we made it this far for a third straight year. I wish I didn't get terribly sick during Super Bowl week of all weeks, and I apologize for my voice once again, but I promised you guys yesterday that you would be getting part two with this preview come hell or high water, and I wasn't about to just dip away from that promise. So I hope you all have a great Sunday, I hope you all enjoy the game, and I hope you all come back to see me tomorrow once the dust settles and we have a new Super Bowl champion, because guess what? For the other 31 teams that didn't win a ring today, the 2020 season starts on Monday. Like I've always said, January playoff runs start with February scouting reports, and it is finally, officially draft season, everybody. So let's get to work. You know where I'll be. I'll see you next week.